I just want to apologize real quick. I, I am suffering from allergies. Uh, it's not COVID, trust me. I've already been tested, but uh, but I do have a fit with allergies, so um, every once in a while I might lose it a little bit here. But uh, everyone, just want to welcome you. And my name is Jim Ford, Secretary for Maryland Department of Transportation. So I want to thank you for inviting us to provide an overview of our draft six-year consolidated transportation program, more commonly known as the CTP, which covers fiscal years 2023 through 2028. I brought a whole MDOT team with me today from State Highway Administration, Administrator Tim Smith, Chief Operating Officer overseeing District Operations, Andre Futel, from the Maryland Transportation Authority, Planning and Program Development Director Melissa Williams from Maryland Transit Administration, Local Transit Support Director Travis Johnston from the Motor Vehicle Administration, Administrator Chrissy Neiser and from Maryland Aviation Administration, Regional Aviation Assistant Director Ashish Salanka, Salanki, on it, I do that all the time. It's just my Baltimore East thing coming out. Um, and also joining us from Secretary's Office, uh, Regional Planning Manager Tyson Byrne. Where's Tyson? Because in case you need a CTP, that's who you want to see. And State Legislative Officer Melissa Ihorn, right in the front. In the pink, she used to work for Addy, so you can figure that out, right? So let me start by taking a minute to look back over what we've accomplished working in partnership with you and other counties from the eastern, from Western Maryland to the Eastern Shore. Thanks to Governor Hogan's record investments in transportation and infrastructure, we've accomplished a great deal over the last eight years. With Governor Hogan's leadership, MDOT immediately began moving forward on top transportation priorities in every region across the state. We've improved 100% of the state's highway system making our roads and bridges much safer and less congested. Mm -hmm. We expanded several busy state roads into four-lane divided highways from Maryland 32 in Central Maryland, and then here on the Eastern Shore, Maryland 404 and US 113. I know both of those were very big projects to you all sitting in this room. And, uh, and those improved safety and reduced the number of head-on collisions, and I think that was one of the key driving points is we were trying to save lives on these roads and so with the divided highways that that helped that of the uh, 69 poorly rated bridges we identified in 2015 SHA has repaired or replaced all of them we're continuing to address aging infrastructure we now have only 26 poorly rated bridges in the state and that's a historical low all these bridges are now under construction funded for construction or in design also on our list of accomplishments is the switch to all electronic tolling across the state. The move is keeping traffic flowing and easing congestion. It is also very good for the environment because we don't have our cars idling so much. Speaking of tolls, very important reminder, time is running out to pay your unpaid tolls and have the late fees waived. Yeah, it's my commercial. Uh, back in February, we announced a customer assistance plan to help you help yourselves. We've, we've given customers nine months to get their late fees waived and pay their unpaid tolls. Uh, on September 1st, we started the 90-day countdown. In fact, with about 31 days, uh, with 31 days in October, we're throwing in an extra day, and the grace period ends November 30th. So the clock is ticking. As of today, customers only have 69 more days left to pay their tolls and get those fees waived. If you haven't already done so, please remind your constituents, family members, neighbors, and colleagues to take advantage of this money-saving opportunity. And that's where we're asking the elected officials to reach out to their constituents and let them know <coughs> about this important um, waiver as far as waiving the uh, extra fees. So, quite frankly, we're only interested in the tolls. We don't want to, you know, have you pay fees. What you got, sir? You can call us and we'll we'll take a look at it. Well, let's talk after the meeting. Okay. okay? 
And um, turning to transit, our systems are also more reliable thanks to Governor Hogan's historic investments in lower uh, maintenance-related interruptions. As our infrastructure governor, he kept Maryland's port and airport open for business throughout the pandemic with continued investments at BWI Thurgood Marshall Airport and Maryland's Port of Baltimore. At BWI Marshall, we're now handling more cargo than Reagan National and Dulles combined. And when, uh, when container ships were backing up at other ports around the country, um, we, were, we were seeing no delays at Maryland's Port of Baltimore. In fact, we welcomed ships that were diverted here because they couldn't be served elsewhere. We'll hear more about these and other major milestones from our transportation business units in just a moment. And I want to stress that Governor Hogan has delivered more projects and more money to local jurisdictions through the highway use of revenue. During this past legislative session, he worked across the aisle with your legislators to get a deal uh, for a better deal for local jurisdictions, increasing the amount of HUR by 33 percent. The successful negotiations allowed us to amend the bill to be even better than what than what was originally proposed. So that's a, that's a dramatic increase to help fund your transportation priorities and will help provide local matching funds to capitalize on funds that would be available through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which we call the IIJA. MDOT is here to help you navigate that federal process. And that brings us to the IIJA. I've been asked for about nine months what we're going to fund with the IIJA. Well, you know, this is it. We're funding the CTP, and uh, I want to make it clear, uh, because you see a lot of the stuff in the press, but I want to make it clear that IIJA is not all new money. It's just simply a, a new name for our, our funding sources. You might have heard of Ice-T, Safety Lou, Sa uh, Safety, and I mean, all these different names. This is for our formula funding, but now it's called IIJA. And it's not all new money. It includes our federal formula funding, including your projects that were already in the final FY 2022 through 27 CTP. And during the next six years of our draft 2023 through 2028 CTP, Maryland has programmed $1.3 billion in new IIJA funding. That's $178 million for airports, $166 million for transit, and 966 million for highways. Now, the the allocations that I just mentioned are based on the federal formula outlined in the IIJA by the federal government. So we're working closely with our federal partners on the specific criteria to program additional projects for both transit and highways. And this funding will help with long-term state of good repair. And it's important to Governor Hogan and to me to advance at least one new priority project in every county and Baltimore City in the form of new highway, transit, or aviation project. There is also potential for some additional projects in the discretionary grants that part of IIJA, and we're exploring those, and, and as always, we're here to help you apply for new grants. And let me tell you, there's some a lot of new grants just for locals that we at the state cannot put in for. Uh, shifting the details in the CTP, I can start off by telling you that this is the largest transportation budget ever. The draft FY 2023 through 2028 CTP totals about $19.9 billion. That's, that's nearly $2.2 billion more than the final FY 22 through 27 CTP of, of about $17.7 billion. As noted earlier, this draft CTP includes a large increase in HUR funds, which you can spend on local projects, the 33% increase delivers hundreds of million dollars more thanks to the agreement between the governor and your legislators. That increase of nearly $2.2 billion in this draft CTP includes $1.3 billion in additional IIJA funds, improved revenue estimates post-pandemic, and MDOT's higher share of the state corporate income tax. This CTP devotes 35% of the budget that's one, uh, I'm sorry, that's $6.9 billion to system preservation. That's about $800 million more than last year's CTP. And these dollars are critical to achieve and maintain a state of good repair for our roads, bridges, rail, port, and airports. 
Just as important, this CTP allows our transportation system to contribute directly to Maryland's economy, our economic recovery. <coughs> That's the balance we need, maintaining our assets, delivering major projects, and planning for the future. That's how we deliver a network that's safe, reliable, accessible, and inclusive for all Marylanders. I want to say it's been an honor to work uh, with our dedicated team of MDOT employees to deliver projects and services every day. I've been highlighting their hard work in, in a video series uh, that we started called Ports Supports Employees. Um, we've shown Marylanders what it's like to be a crane operator, 165 feet up in the air. Uh, I'm scared to death of heights, and so you will not see a sequel to that video. Um, and that was, of course, filmed at the Port of Baltimore. And, and then I also went out with state highway crews and filled potholes. And I also went out with other state highway crews and picked up litter. And so now, you're going to hear Tim Ports talk a little trash. And what I mean by that is litter along our highways costs us some serious dough. More than $60 million over eight years. That's an average of $7 million a year. That's $7 million that could be going to projects that we need uh, throughout the state. So think about that. What a waste. And I'm sure everybody in here could think of other programs we can use this for, but we launched this program. Uh, you can see two superheroes here. That's to, shame, that's to have kids shame their parents into not throwing stuff out the window. And, and how this works, you got the two prongs that come down to, on a headrest, and these two loops go around that, hangs on the back of your, your seat, and then it, you have an opportunity to put the trash where it belongs, and then when you get home or your destination, you can throw the trash away properly. So, you know, this is something that we're really pushing hard because it's unsightly. It clogs our drains, which means you can hydroplane, and it gets into our water systems, Chesapeake Bay and, and other rivers and streams. And so we need to get this word out. Anything you can do to help us get this word out, um, we would appreciate. And, you know, if we all do our part, I think we could stop, you know, garbage and $60 million from, get this, literally uh, going out the window. So if you would, please help us out. And I'm sure our SHA Administrator Tim Smith would love it if his crews could focus on actual road work and use that $60 million for something else. Right, Tim? Absolutely. Absolutely. So now, speaking of Tim, I'll turn it over to Tim, uh, Tim Smith. Administrator for MDOT SHA. Thank you, Jim. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to lead the state highway team and be back with you again this year. Uh, part of that honor is uh, being around folks like our chief operating officer, uh, Andre Fertrell, and the entire District 1 team, Mike, Tracy, Dan, John. Um, it, it's an honor to lead this team. So last year when I was here, I talked about uh, what we were doing to build our shelf of projects. And it's, it was kind of fell into three different categories. One was other, du other duties as assigned, right? Um, fell into three basic categories. One was asset management, where uh, that's really where we employ strategies to ensure our infrastructure is in a state of good repair. Uh, second was accessibility, where we're, we're focusing on ensuring all our users uh, have safe systems to be accessible and, and, and so we can reach our vision zero goal of no, no fatalities on our roadways. And lastly, mobility, where we're using emerging technologies and to implement innovative strategies so we can maximize our footprint of our existing roadway to get more cars more efficiently from points A to B. So we're continuing to, to use those innovative ideas, deploy strategies to connect our customers to life's opportunities. This Secretary Ports, or Jim, as he's told us to refer to him as, talks about, talked about the progress over the last several years. So in Wacombo County, um, and following kind of that asset management philosophy, uh, that I mentioned earlier, we focused on keeping our roadways in a state of good repair. And I just wanted to highlight a few locations that we've completed just in the past year. So I know we've, we've touched on Maryland 353, uh, westbound US 50 business, Maryland 347, Maryland 349, US 50, just to touch on a few over the past year. Um, and then right here in Salisbury, uh, we're 
continuing our efforts there on Salisbury Boulevard at US 13 Business for that bridge replacement. We're currently focused on uh, the Verizon utility locations right now, but that's one of our older structures. That's a 1937 structure that needs a little TLC. Um, we're starting construction on that in the spring. Um, but Secretary mentioned it, but harnessing the benefit of the IIJ enabled funding, our SHA team will continue to improve conditions and add value across the state over the next five years. A great example of that in Wacombe Cocana is uh, we're making safety and mobility improvements at several intersections along US 50 corridor between Hebron and Salisbury. So we've dedicated uh, $7 million worth of scope that involves improving three uh, at-grade intersections and four crossovers. So we'll be lengthening the acceleration and deceleration lanes at all seven of those locations uh, to improve safety for both those traffic merging as well as the through traffic. So in closing, I want to just stress the continued collaboration and partnership with the county. We just had a, a great meeting with them prior to this. Understanding each other's priorities as well as ex expectations is the key to success. Building those relationships helps us build the lever, uh, um, excuse me, uh, helps build, better deliver our SHA mission. And we know those relationships aren't built in just one night or one meeting that are built throughout the entire year. So thank you for your time and I'll pass it over to our teammate at MDTA, Melissa Williams. Thank you, Tim. As the secretary mentioned, time is running out with MDTA's civil penalty waiver grace period. I urge you to take advantage of the plan now by paying unpaid video tolls either in one payment or incrementally between now and 11.59 p.m. on November 30th. For every video toll transaction paid in full during the nine-month waiver grace period, the related civil penalty is waived. Toll bill referrals to the Central Collection Unit and MVA have ceased temporarily, but will resume on Dece December 1st. Starting on December 1st, customers will be responsible for the full amount of all unpaid tolls and civil penalties, which will be due based on the printed due dates on your bill. Call and web chat wait times are much lower than before, so customers can easily reach out to us to resolve any of their tolling questions or needs. Um, elected officials should have received a letter encouraging you to alert your constituents to start their toll payments now and not to wait until it's too late. I'd also like to update you on some of our projects. MDTA is focusing strongly on our system preservation program. Work on the Bay Bridge automated lane closure system began in February of 2020 and will be fully operational by this fall. This project will improve safety and efficiency during periods when opening and closing lanes, including two-way traffic operations on the bridge. The system includes new large overhead lane use signals and full color dynamic message signs, a first in the state, which are supported by illuminated pavement markers and automated lane closure gates. Pre-construction services are underway for the Bay Bridge eastbound deck replacement with major construction expected to begin next year. The majority of the work will take place during off-peak times, including overnight hours, to minimize traffic and local impacts. As most of you are aware, <clears throat> we recently completed three open houses for the $28 million Bay Crossing Tier 2 National Environmental Policy Act in early September. We are also continuing to collect public feedback until October 14th. It was great news when the governor announced the funding for Tier 2 in June, following the Federal Highway Administration's April approval of the combined Final Environmental Impact Study and Record of Decision for the Bay Crossing Study Tier 1 NEPA. This four to five year Tier 2 study will build upon the Tier 1 findings and identify specific alignment alternatives within Corridor 7. The two mile wide corridor runs from the Severn River Bridge in Anne Arundel County to the US 5301 split in Queen Anne's County. In addition to our recent open houses, there will be several additional opportunities for public participation during this multi-year project. I encourage you to visit baycrossingstudy.com for more information on the project. I would like to now turn it over to Travis Johnson at MTA. Thank you, Melissa, and good evening, everyone. I'm glad to be here with you to report that it is, an, it is an exciting time to be working in transit in Maryland. Through the Office of Local Transit Support, MTA continues to ensure transit systems across the state remain a safe and reliable transportation option for local residents. MTA is also preparing for the future of transit. We are in the final stages of completing the first 50-year statewide transit plan. Building upon existing regional and local transit plans across the state, 
the plan will outline a 50-year vision for transit in Maryland and help define transit needs across the state for future generations. We appreciate Wacomico County's participation in the development of the plan and look forward to moving into implementation. MTA also makes a significant investment in transit in Wacomico County by providing more than $4.1 million in operating and capital grants to the Tri-County Council of the Lower Eastern Shore to support shore transit operations. And lastly, but certainly not least, I will close my remarks with noting MTA is pleased to award nearly $80,000 for the City of Sal Salisbury's statewide transit innovation grant, which will conduct a feasibility study on fixed route and microtransit service that would complement existing service provided by Shore Transit. Thank you. I will now toss it over to MVA Administrator Chrissy Neiser. Thank you, Travis, and it's a pleasure to be with you tonight as always. At MBA, we continue to focus on providing that premier customer service, both inside of our branch offices as well as through our online services. In fact, we're really proud to say that we've finally completed our IT modernization project known as Customer Connect that was completed in December of last year. With the completion of that, we now have a 360 view of the customer, so it links your driver and vehicle information. And not only if you come in and interact with our agents, do they have that complete view of everything related to your MBA transactions, you also have access to that. So I encourage everybody to sign up for your My MBA account. Um, through that, not only can you make appointments, but you can also see any letters that we've sent to you. You can see the status of your driver's license, if you're a CDL driver, your medical certificate, um, and anything related to your vehicle as well in terms of your registration and any uh, potential issues there. Um, and so really it's made a huge difference in terms of how customers continue to interact with us. In fact, now 74% of our transactions are being completed through those alternative methods and not really in our branch office environment. And that allows us to serve our customers that need to come visit us in person more efficiently. Um, we do remain appointment only, and um, that has enabled us to really serve customers in a very efficient manner. So 75% of our customers are experiencing a wait time of 15 minutes or less. Um, and, and sometimes that number, frankly, is as high as 80% of our customers experiencing that. So we really are pleased with the ability to make everybody's time, um, good use of their time, and get them in and out quickly. Another thing I'm really proud of, and I think the Salisbury branch is a great example of this, is delivering that one-stop uh, approach to um, services for our <coughs> residents. Just like they don't care whether it's a state road or local, local road, they don't care whether it's one state agency or another, they just want to get the service they need. So in Salisbury, we have the ability to do your Department of Natural Resources services. So especially if you have a boat and a trailer, you can take care of both um, transactions in one place. We also have our Veterans Affairs office located right there, which is another great partnership. Um, TSA PreCheck, so if you want to use the airport in an expedient manner, as well as TWIC services, which um, is security access you need to to get onto the port premise. So before we had that there, folks had to travel a very long way in order to be able to get those services. And stay tuned, we've got another new service coming to Salisbury soon, so more to come there. But I think it really offers a great benefit for customers not to have to go to multiple locations to get done what they need. In May, Maryland also became the second state to launch Mobile ID and Apple Wallet. This is a voluntary and free service that we offer to Maryland residents. You might ask, why would I want to get my driver's license or ID card available through the wallet. Um, the reason is simple. When you turn over your physical license, you're giving all of your personal information to whoever that end user is. TSA is a great example. That's the one um, use case that we're currently doing. So if you fly out one of our airports, you can use your mobile ID. Um, TSA actually only needs four data elements, but yet we hand over everything every time you go through a checkpoint. So it's just one way to better control your personal information. We all know security is something that's really important to all of our residents. And if you're an Android user, stay tuned. We've got an announcement coming soon about that. We are working on a solution there too. Real ID is a topic we've been focused on for a long time. Um, Maryland is up to 87% Real ID compliant. Um, that compares with 51% of our of American residents, so Maryland's doing very well with that. In addition, we remain committed to developing solutions to save lives on our roadways. 
We lost 562 people last year, which I know we all recognize as unacceptable when we have to find creative ways to reduce those fatalities. Unfortunately, it continues to be the same kind of issues. We're seeing you know, that aggressive driving, high rates of speed, impaired driving, and lack of seatbelt use. Governor Hogan last week did announce more than 183,000 for Wacomico County agencies to address highway safety. Local jurisdictions are also encouraged to develop their own strategic highway safety plans that take on the principles of the statewide plan and then adopt them for your own local needs. Federal funds are also available through the Safe Streets for All grant program for the development of a new action plan. MBA strives to be the best in the nation in everything we do, and I couldn't be more proud of our customer service agents who continue to come in every day and deliver that premier customer service during incredibly challenging times. But not only that, they're the ones who come up with a lot of these great ideas of how we can continue to improve service for Maryland residents. So thank you for your time, and I'm now going to turn it over to Ashish Talanki at the Maryland Aviation Administration. Thank you, Chrissy. Good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to be in Wicomico County again. Uh, I want to express my thanks to uh, Council President Cannon for your hospitality this evening. Very much appreciated. Thank you. At the Aviation Administration, we're focused on economic development, delivering on our projects to our customers, and that not doesn't include just BWI Marshall and Martin State Airport, but all of our airports statewide, including Salisbury Regional. And I want to take this time also to recognize Tony and the hard work that uh, they're doing over there at Salisbury and a lot of the improvements that we're moving forward on there. It's wonderful to see progress. Thank you. At Mar BWI Marshall, I want to share, um, remains an important engine, economic engine for our community. It's a transportation resource, not just for our region, but the entire state. We're focused with our airline partners, first and foremost, to support commerce that supports tourism business development, as well as cargo operations. In terms of operations at BWI Marshall, our airline passenger traffic has continued to rebound post-pandemic. So far, we're at 80% of our pre-pandemic level. And that's a good trend and a good direction to be at. And also during peak periods, some of the holiday seasons, we've actually exceeded our pre-pandemic levels. So all good trends indicating that our traffic is coming back and there's a strong demand. As an example, three new airlines have launched service at BWI Marshall. These are domestic airlines. And on the international side, we've had uh, traffic routes, uh, new airlines uh, starting routes right th uh, into BWI, also demonstrating international demand for our region and our airport. On the other side of traffic, uh, 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 passenger traffic, there's air cargo. And as uh, Jim mentioned earlier, air cargo is a continuing growth trend for us at the airport. In numbers, it, last year, we had 618 million pounds of cargo that we transported off out of the airport. That makes up about 55% of our metro region in traffic counts, and pounds, uh, if you will. And so, again, as we said, we're leading the air region in uh, cargo movements. It's definitely a trend that uh, we want to encourage. Amazon and a few other cargo operators are continuing that trend as we're seeing around the region. Swinging over to our capital program at BWI Marshall, I mentioned this uh, last time I had the opportunity to brief you. Um, well, we're still working on our main program, restroom renovations, Southwest Airlines maintenance hangar, as well as our car, uh, concourse AB baggage handling system. All of these projects combined will add amenities and improvements to our passengers traveling through the airport. In addition, as the Secretary mentioned, we have IIJA funds coming to our two airports, BWI Marshall and Martin State. $178 million. Majority of those projects, are money is going towards airside improvement, safety types of projects. These are major airfield projects that's going to, again, allow us to move traffic safely and efficiently. Lastly, I'd like to share with you our statewide aviation grant program. For fiscal 22, 23, excuse me, we're funding $3.5 million to our regional community airports. And that for Salisbury Regional Airport, that includes a $27,000 project to support the land acquisitions associated with permitting. As we move forward into the runway extension program and the real construction, we'll look forward to supporting Salisbury along with our FAA partners in helping to deliver on that project as well. Thank you for your time, and now it's my pleasure to turn it back to the Transportation Secretary. Jim? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ashish. And uh, thank you, everyone, again, for the opportunity to present our six-year CTP program. 
and uh, be happy to answer any questions that, that you may have. Uh, first of all, um, I want to thank the county for hosting us tonight, and it was uh, actually really helpful to have to kind of lead and talk about the Salisbury um, Ocean City Regional Airport. Um, for the record, Senator Mary Beth Carosa representing District 38, which is all of Worcester, all of Wicomico, and um, more than half uh, more than half of Wicomico, all of Somerset, all of Worcester. So I say that because I know we're in Wicomico, but you know you gave an overview. And um, I wanted first to thank the entire team um, on the fact that, especially during COVID, and we had so many constituents contacting us about all the different issues, whether it was MBA or mm -hmm. what was going on with the project with State Highway, that you all have always been responsive. Um, I guess my request or my uh, what I wanted to raise tonight in, in front of the community is, um, we know that you know you are. This administration is winding down, and we are. We have several projects that you all have talked about tonight, and others um, that we're thinking you know for the future. And to the extent that what I'm hearing is, it seems to me that a lot of the projects end up becoming prioritized as we continue to tie them to safety issues. It, it seems any of us on. You know, in the executive branch and those of us who are elected officials, it's, it's public safety first. So to the extent, um, and not to put you on the spot, but to know between now and January on some of the projects that, you know, that maybe are already in the plan, but we also would like to um, maybe think about future projects. Can you, what can you share with us as far as how we can work with you, you know, right up to make, basically leverage um, you know the current administration's commitment to our shore projects so it's a good question um, obviously with any new administration they can have different priorities right and so um, what what we've tried to do is look out for as I mentioned earlier every county uh, and Baltimore City throughout the state and what you'll see in a lot of cases, we try to move it from planning and design to construction. And and pretty much once it goes to construction, they're really hard to pull back, almost impossible to pull back because, you know, you're giving contractors uh, the notice to proceed and, and all that stuff. So it'd be rare to do that. Um, the projects that, that would be of concern would be those ones that are just in planning for example, because even at design, they start to get a little more difficult to pull back. But um, I, I would think that in most cases, the next administration would also continue with many of these projects. As you know, hardly any project is begun and ends with any administration. Um, actually, the Nice Bridge, Nice Middleton Bridge, is probably one of the very few it started in this administration and will end in this administration. But, but most projects cross administrations, and it's rare for them to pull back totally on a lot of on a lot of issues because we go through that CTP process, which is in law, as you know. And so, um, again, rare, but it can happen. But I, I just don't see a lot of them being pulled back. I think there are good projects, as you mentioned, safety projects. And nobody wants to pull back a safety project. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Speaker Pro Tem, Sharice Sample Hughes, representing District 37A, where I'm going and Dorchester. Um, thank you all for coming down. I know you love the Eastern Shore. You don't want to leave. And we <laughs> always love to have you. Uh, I just have two quick questions. Um, one in regards to... Um, Maryland 347. I just wanted to understand that project a little bit more because the center and I, we keep getting um, <laughs> lots of phone calls, lots of heated uh, firefighters um, about that intersection. So I just want to understand that one a little bit more. And then the second piece is, I don't know if you um, delved into this or not, but what supports uh, will we be able to receive for the, um, the direction of moving into electric 
vehicles and electric uh, transit buses. And so I was just curious for our shore transit um, and then of course other ones on the upper shore. Uh, what, kind, what does that look like being we are going in that direction by a certain date? So I know that we have, uh, was it 10 buses that are already uh, been procured for, for MTA overall? Yes, uh, for, at this for. point, you know, we mm -hmm. do have um, the law <laughs> that we're right. that we got to abide by. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that what some people need to understand is that, you know, when you go, you have everybody in the nation trying to do the same thing. Right. And so there's only about, what, five companies, Travis, in the United States. On the heavy duty side. Yeah. Yeah. It's big, I mean, big the, the big buses, yeah. the, the large uh, buses. Um, there's only about five companies that make those, so you can only imagine you got to get into the queue, mm -hmm. and everybody's trying to get into the queue. So it's going to take a while, but but we're on track so far. We're also working very closely with the utility companies because you can have all the electric buses you want if you don't have recharging stations, exactly. and and in many cases, you know, um, they may have to put new transformers in or maybe even a substation in some cases, uh, depending on how many buses it, or vehicles uh, may be on that grid. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you got your cutaways, <coughs> which are the smaller buses. And um, I'm not even sure they're quite there yet. Just one manufacturer. One manufacturer. One manufacturer to make the cutaways. So, so I'm just trying to put it in perspective for, you know, elected officials that, mm -hmm. you know, we can create all the laws we want, but there's there's some, you know, logistical situations that we have to deal with. And when mm -hmm. you have one manufacturer uh, for cutaways, that's going to be pretty pretty tall order. So it may be a while for those, but Travis, do you have any anything to add? Or? Yeah, and just for clarification, so the locally operated transit systems are not part of the mandate. So the, the tra your local transit systems are not being mandated to transition to electric. electric. However, okay. we are currently providing a study for all of the lots uh, that should be available in March. And it's going to be the first kind of rough order magnitude look at what a transition uh, would look like for each of our lots. So it's going to pr provide some high level cost estimates. <coughs> As Jim said, we're going to be reaching out to the local utility companies to make sure or to see what's available at, mm -hmm. at certain sites. Um, so we think that'll be a great starting point for our lots to, you know, start to measure if they're ready to do it or to plan uh, should they choose to go that route. But just to, again, to clarify, they are not mandated Good. right now. Good. Thank I'm glad you, you clarified that because, um, as you know, when we were on the floor debating and we were already at the end of the session, it's just like everything was just, you know, there. School buses, regular transit. We were just thinking everything. Yeah. So thank you for that clarification, but that does sound like a good step. Yeah. But I also want to make one other point. We're also um, looking to train our current employees mm -hmm. for use of combustion engines and looking to help train them into the EV world. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, Actually, we had a meeting today with a whole bunch of high schools, community colleges, and and, um, and tech schools um, to to help have them help train employees so that they're ready for the for the EV world because it's mm -hmm. going to be a big transition. So um, we're working on on that aspect also. So I didn't want to forget that part of it. Oh, sure. Thank you for the information. Sure. Yes, indeed. Tim? 347. So when you said 347, I'm assuming you mean 347 at 50 yes. location. Uh -huh. So yep. help me with some of the concerns that are being shared. Ooh. Our fire trucks coming on to Route 50 and wanting to safely cross. Um, a lot of accidents. Um, not so much this, this site, but right there before you approach 347 at Rock and Walk. And, I mean, no, that vicinity that we have on here as a um, project. So I was just curious. I just wanted to understand what is being it's earmarked here um, with funding and design underway, what does that really sound like in layman's terms or look like? Yeah, so what we're, what we're trying to do is prevent left-hand turns because that's usually where we have the accidents. Mm -hmm. Right. The challenge is right. then, um, I'm sorry, you're right, crashes. <laughs> yeah. I have, to, I have to be corrected sometimes. <laughs> um, but what we've created now is instead of left-hand turns, you have to go up and basically make a U-turn or a, you know what we call sometimes call a J-turn. But what those in, those particular crossovers and intersections weren't designed originally for that. So as you turn and then you need to accelerate, those acceleration lanes aren't long enough. So you have those difficult merging areas, and you have people that are traveling on 50 that aren't planning mm -hmm. on people merging. 
So we're giving, we're basically extending those Excel lanes to provide more time for cars to get up to proper speed before they merge over. Um, and then also on the other side is, you know, uh, we're trying to give like, additional room for deceleration. So you're not slowing down to 35 in the fast lane and then getting over in the left lane. So it's just extending those Excel and decel lanes to, to, to provide opportunities for the, those merging traffic to get up to speed before they go out in the traffic. Okay, okay, thank you. That brings a better understanding. Um, but I still think that may and will be um, concerned that we'll hear again from the fire departments. So I just probably want to have a one-on-one -on -one with you on yeah. that one. Yeah, and we can absolutely okay. work with them. If sure there's that. challenges sure. there, I want to make sure that they get to where they need to. So that would be great, absolutely. thank you. No, if you would, oh. please share that with us. Sure. Because, um, you know, as I like to say, sometimes you got to be our eyes and ears, mm -hmm. and, and you know your house better than we do, <laughs> uh, I like to say. And so, it's just really helpful that if we understand more about some of the challenges that you have, mm -hmm. then we can try to address them at the same time. Okay. So please, yeah, Sounds get back good. with us on that. And get, you can get directly with Tim or Andre, uh, okay. one or the other. They're both, they're both really good. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Senator Addy Eckert, I'm from District 37, the other half of White Comico County. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you so much for the easy pass responsiveness in working with our constituents. That's been awesome. I, and I haven't had any concerns about MVA lately. Good. So like you're family. doing a great <laughs> job. We appreciate that. And uh, we know there's good work going on at the port and the airport. And that's critical because we have so many businesses here on the lower shore and the mid and upper shore that really depend on the port for cargo. And I know it's been a challenging time, um, but we are so glad that our port was available to be able to pick up the slack during the pandemic. That's, that's really significant. And then I would add, um, our district engineers always are responsive and do a super job for us. So please extend to them. Um, they're not here tonight. Our deepest appreciation for their service and work as well. And I'm, can I have a carton of the trash bags? Yeah, we can give you plenty of them. We, I need plenty of them. We have a trash pickup. I pick up trash with the team oh, from our roadways. So um, local and state um, that go through Dorchester County. And I can tell you there are three of us. We pick up at least three to five Walmart bags and larger in an hour every week it's crazy it's a it's a major issue and i think the initiative to be able to educate our young people mm -hmm. to put pressure on the parents to be able to not throw stuff out the windows as you're driving down the highway is is very significant so Good. we can certainly help you in any way we'd like to we have a trash pickup actually in in uh, cambridge on saturday morning so i'll grab some thank Great. you yeah, yeah feel free <laughs> you don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be brief. Delegate Wayne Hartman representing 38C. Wanted to thank all of you for being here. Um, I have to agree. The MVA issues, everything, every, everyone's been so responsive, so thank you. Um, tonight we heard uh, from Warwick about the concern with the access out of the parking lot. That's been something that's been on, on this request for, for, I believe, several years, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Um, so is, is there a reason, you know, from, from, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, I think it was overlooked some of the development that's going on, not only the growth at the college, but there's a, a business development going on, um, in that very good directionally west of, west of the college, um, a business park with, uh, Royal Farms, Arby's and future expansion across the street, a huge 7-Eleven with a, a truck, uh, depot and stuff is going in there. So that intersection is going to continue to get worse. And we heard the concerns of safety for those students to be able to get out of there if there was ever a need. And I think just to eliminate some congestion at that intersection would be important. So, you know, if it can't be done, if there's reason because of, you know, rules interpretation is so close to the intersection, whatever, if you could let us know and how we can work to, to, to make that happen, I would appreciate it. So I would say the first thing is, uh, if you could share the plans for the development that's coming in, 
because as you know, with, when new developments come in, they have to do a traffic impact study. And through that traffic impact study, they may have to mitigate that intersection, quite frankly, uh, to get the permits to do that. Um, I'd have to ask Tim about the uh, Route 50 area, if that's a controlled access road or? No, so I, I guess two things there. One is what Secretary mentioned, it'd be good to know what the, 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 the county as well as those developer plans are long term. There, there are pad sites that have been developed and are available. Um, I, I don't know what, con you know what's happening as far as future construction, as far as what's intended on going there. The lots are <laughs> developed. Arby's went in there, if I'm not mistaken. Royal Farm is there. Mm -hmm. And across the street, what was a, a previous gas station is being redeveloped, in, from my understanding, into a, a, a larger 7-Eleven with, uh, you know, a, an area for trucks to fuel and everything else. So it's just, just going to add to the congestion there. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So, so, so I was, what I was going to say, the second part is, uh, we need to look at the entire system, not necessarily mm -hmm. just that intersection. Because I would imagine, I, I, I completely understand the, the, the college's concern about trying to evacuate quickly. What we got to look at is the entire system. Is I'm, I'm assuming not everyone's going to go east leaving <laughs> the, the, the school. So we're going to have to figure out what those impacts are downstream. And like I said, if we can look at what business development's going on and look at our infrastructure, you have my commitment to at least look at this a traffic study to figure out how to handle that. Um, but we, we, we need to be mindful of what the impacts are up and down, up and downstream on our okay. infrastructure. We'll follow up on that. But it's still Thank access, you. right? Correct. There's fee for that, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the way it works with, um, you know, access permits onto a highway, there's a fee for that, right? Because No, I'm talking about the other access, okay. the other access point. Any, any access point onto a state highway, there's a value to that access point because we pay for all that to begin with. And so the way it is in state law is that that to um, get an access, access onto a state road, there's um, we do an appraisal and figure out what that's worth, and then whoever wants that access has to pay that that fee it's I mean this has been around forever yeah 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 we do it with everybody because it's state law yeah yeah hey Johnny oh yeah 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 go ahead uh -huh. yeah show up at the end throw us a bone yeah yeah I apologize for being late I had a couple of meetings to be to attend this evening but thank you for being here I've got the books. I'll go through them. There's there's a project that's come up routinely, and I wanted to make uh, yeah, present it to you to make sure all things were being considered. But railroad crossing, I'm not sure if Delegate Adams is here. I haven't talked to him in a while. Um, railroad crossing is a, is a road on Route 50 that's caught a lot of attention, and there's been a lot of discussion about making improvements there. And um, and I just would uh, reiterate, and I've, I've um, made this suggestion a couple times. I just want to do it again. Uh, that the local emergency responders, fire service are included in the planning for the improvements that are being made there. It's, it's very important. It's a very, uh, um, man, it is a politically charged. There's so many interests. What's the intersection? Uh, Railroad and 50. Railroad and Right 50. by Wright's Market. Um, it's an access into Hebron. Um, so it'd be Hebron Fire Company. And, um, and I, hey, I, I miss, it already came up. Well. I'm sorry. It's also Maryland 430. Yeah, I apologize. My still doing my sidewalk slang. Um, okay. I, I also want to sing praises for all the help that our office has gotten. Um, Administrator Nizer um, carried carried a lot of water for us. Uh, a, a, a existing program uh, problem that I'm sure you're aware of is the Easy Pass and this billing. Um, there are a lot of people who are embroiled in a situation where they can't get through. Um, they've mm -hmm. got disputes. Um, we've been successful in helping people that have contacted our office, but that's a percentage of people that have, have had problems. So that even though the, our offices are able to resolve some of those problems, I just want to make sure you're aware 
there are a number of people that still have those existing problems. Recently? Yeah. Because right now, we have a 10-second wait. Well, we're, we're averaging we're, 10 seconds for wait time on the phone. We measure it every day. Okay. So I find it uh, hard to believe that that's occurring now. Now, I would not disagree that it happened in the past before we expanded the amount of people that we have on the call center. Yeah. But 10 seconds, I'd say that's, that's probably better than Disney World right now. All right, yeah, but it was 45 minutes for somebody yesterday. So I want to make sure that I'm not, yeah. I'm not yeah. making allegations. I'm just yeah. the messenger. You yeah. know what they say, gotcha. don't shoot the messenger. No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> yeah. But I'm just saying, it's just, it's rare that yeah. it would take that long. Um, I'm not saying it won't because it depends on when you call, obviously. So mm -hmm. you could have a flux of uh, a calls or people taking a long time to take care of things. But the uh, the call wait time has been 10 seconds recently. Okay. Well, I just wanted to share that with you. And sure. I, as I get information, we forward it as yeah. quickly as we can. Yeah. But, of course, I pick this up at the grocery store, at the <laughs> hardware store, and always pumping gas, you know. Um, and so that's that's uh, a concern I wanted to share. Um, sure. And there was another issue brought up dealing with the um, trucks that assist with broken down vehicles. There's an acronym for them. They're MRAC trucks. Uh, they have the big arrows. Um, they'll help tow a vehicle your, when your the vehicle's... Our, your, our chart recovery? Chart, chart yeah. trucks, that's it, yeah. Um, and there was some question about whether chart trucks are moved uh, from the shore during certain times of the year or not. And then um, that was an issue that was brought up um, with some of the emergency responders. They were asking where the chart trucks were and the chart trucks had, had been moved. And I don't know if, in fact, they were moved, but, um, but if they are being moved and there, there is any um, plans for how those trucks are, are um, uh, deployed around the state, I just encourage uh, the department to make sure that the emergency services are included in those discussions also. So. Understood. Uh, so back to the, the 50th Railroad, that is actually under design and we will absolutely partner with the, the fire local fire department to make sure we address their concerns. Um, but to, to chart vehicles, um, we have those around the state, but we do have additional deployments during what we consider beach season from um, March through November. Mm -hmm. um, so we have extra extra patrols during that time. Um, but if you, if uh, we would not have removed chart trucks. Absolutely not. Uh, okay. We would only be, I, I'm constantly beating on him and others to, to have an expansion of that. And that takes resources, but that I think that's what helps us when we can, we can address all our states roadways. And actually often we, we moved other resources to the shore. Uh, especially during snowstorms, we bring them out into other districts and bring them down here. Okay. So it's actually the opposite in, in many cases. But yeah, I mean, those trucks are up and down all over the place. So anytime they hear somebody stranded or something, they're off. So it may be that they're used to seeing them on this road in this spot, but mm -hmm. you know, they move around a lot. Well, uh, I, again, I want to thank you for being here. Um, sure. These are things I'm just being the messenger. That's great. And, and not being an accuser by any means. And, uh, <coughs> and I'd no, like to thank to you for all the help that we've gotten every time we've called. So sure. thank you. Sure. Thanks. I'm the only one that hadn't spoken yet. <laughs> State delegation, but uh, Secretary Port, thank you for being here. Sure. And uh, my first question is on... Uh, transit and the support of shore transit and we sort of been flatlined we learned last night uh, funded for uh, since 2010 and uh, I don't know if we're going to see some more revenue or opportunities there but it is very important for our, for our area uh, for our citizens to get to the work in the different locations being a rural area and while I'm on that topic, I want to mention, as we talk about these intersections, keep in mind we're an agricultural-based community, and, and we have big equipment that has to cross these uh, intersections at times. So uh, please keep that in mind as well as you design these things. You've heard that a few times. Travis, you want to sure. you want to try and answer the... Yeah, uh, just... Uh, so the operational funding has been flat for some time, uh, but as Jim talked about, the new IIJA has given us an opportunity to take a look at 
how we're funding our locally operated transit systems um, and with the increased funding there available for transit starting in FY24 we'll be moving to a service-based formula uh, which happens to work out really good for shore transit so starting in yeah, 24 I'll you say. will see a significant increase in operating funds for shore transit um, and you know our capital you guys are getting about five buses this year as well as almost a million in preventative maintenance wow. uh, so that the capital the capital is you know we're doing pretty good on the capital side Thank you. Yeah, and I would say that previous formula was based on population and that was in law so um, we're now working on a, a different formula that's going to show that it's going to provide funding for service Mm -hmm. I have just one last question. <laughs> you would sure. expect that, wouldn't you? I would. Okay. First of all, <laughs> I, I, your comment about the project starting in one administration, yeah. and if you'll recall, and I want to personally thank you, um, Secretary Ports, because we worked on the 113 widening going back to Governor Ehrlich's administration, and yet Governor Hogan came in and he promised to finish it, and you did. And it's been a huge safety issue so i wanted to first of all publicly thank 404 you 404 too so that's right 404 absolutely with exactly that's right exactly both of them so my i guess my question and my request is you always get more requests than what you can do in a you know your the ctp you know i've gone through this a lot of time and effort is put into this what why comico county did mm -hmm. um and they're very good if you go through it and prioritizing and then you get to the municipal request mm -hmm and a lot of time and thought on our smaller municipalities. And I think when, when you really go through this, you see that Wicomico County, Salisbury, Ocean City Regional Airport has been at the top of this list. So much so that, and wanted just to make sure to share with you, the tri-county money that Governor Hogan approved that came down for Wicomico for the three counties here, mm -hmm taking those three counties, Wicomico County put its entire allotment specifically for the Salisbury Ocean City Regional Airport. So I think it's important that you all know kind of the local skin in the game and commitment to this as, as you work through that. But as these other priorities, knowing again, you have more requests than what you can put on in a CTP, can you, as a follow-up to this meeting, my request is give us a little bit more direction and feedback on some of these projects that it have either been on in the past, like the Warwick Community College um, access issue, and then some of, especially some of the smaller municipalities that, you know, they, they made, they've made this cut, uh, they're in this list, but yet, you know, we want to continue to elevate that. Maybe you could give us some guidance on how to keep those type of projects on track as well. So that would be the requests that um, I think I would make on behalf of all of the county and our, the municipalities that we represent. Okay, great. We'll be glad to get back to you. We had that homework. <laughs> <laughs> you a teacher. <laughs> Anybody else? Is that it? All right. Well, thank you all. And, uh, as I mentioned, we enjoyed the partnership over the years, and uh, we hope to continue uh, working very closely with you. Thank you.